2018, as well as laboratory scientists and people involved in public health before. But it's been a long time since I've had the opportunity to chat to colleagues across several disciplines in this faculty. And I've titled today's presentation, The Waiting Room. And I begin with this image, which is a painting from 1940 by a very famous South African painter called Gerard Sekoto. He wasn't at all famous when he painted this image. In fact, he was in a TB sanatorium on the border of KwaZulu-Natal and the present day Eastern Cape, recovering from a very severe bout of TB. He'd been involved in the war effort and he had been before that a laborer in Johannesburg, working as so many men in that area did in the migrant labor system between his home area which was around the, the Ponderland border and coming up to the reef to Johannesburg to work as an itinerant laborer. And then during the Second World War, he was sucked in to the war effort, as were many men of his generation, providing services, moving between the big industrial settings. He wasn't an underground miner, which many of his family members were, but he was involved in manufacturing work and really a, a huge boost in manufacturing and mining, the results of which were sent mainly as profits to the United Kingdom to help the UK with its international war effort to try and defeat the Nazis and to get them not only out of Europe and the Pacific, but also out of taking over many countries in Africa. And during that period, he contracted tuberculosis and he wore himself down with work, which many, many people in the country did. There were very, very high rates of tuberculosis amongst poorer whites, amongst uh, men of all different colors, South Africans of Indian extraction, mixed background South Africans, and uh, South Africans of African origin during the Second World War. And it was the first time in South African history in the 1940s that large numbers of women contracted tuberculosis, women who were not living in industrial compounds, and it really became an epidemic disease and uh, spread across the whole country. And while recovering in a sanatorium, which was a prevalent form of isolation treatment at the time, Gerard Sakoto picked up pen and ink and he began to paint. And this was an, an, a really uh, powerful and moving piece that he created. And much later in his life, when he was globally famous, and he'd left South Africa during the final years of apartheid to try and develop an artistic career abroad and was invited to Paris. He ended up also in a sanatorium just outside of Paris in his dying days and he returned to some of these paintings. And Witt's Art Museum did a fantastic exhibition of Gerard Sokoto's work about five years ago and they used his work to try and get South African doctors and nurses health professionals, people involved in HIV AIDS and AIDS care. I remember that Professor Mahdi, our current uh, and brand new Dean of the Health Science Faculty, came across to look at his work because his work spoke to the intersection of art, dis-ease, physical embodied illness and disease, and the question of medical education and the medical gaze and the need for a return to discussion between the arts and the humanities. Next slide, please. Next one, please. So one of the most famous paintings of the 19th century was by Luke Fielders, and it's called The Doctor. And it seemed to exemplify the ideal of a heroic, kind, empathetic, doctor of the late 19th century, which would have been the ideal that was being propagated and the ideal to which doctors were being trained in late 19th century Europe, sort of at the height of the Victorian era. And here we have a very tired, kind looking older doctor, an older male sitting in the room of a, a young child whose life is ebbing away. She's dying of tuberculosis. He's come to her home. He cannot give her therapeutic treatment because he's exhausted all of his possibilities. You can see that he's been giving her spoons of medicine in a cup. Um, her family members are hovering in the background, including probably her younger father. 
It's in the home of a working class person. He's dressed as a much more middle class or upper class person in Victorian suit. But her home is a simple one, probably a two roomed home with no electricity. And he is giving her his support and her family support and solidarity by watching over her, by caring for her as her life ebbs away. It's a tragic scene. It's a scene where she will lose her life. It shows the limits of uh, curative medicine, but it's also a scene designed to show us how people were beginning to trust medical doctors. But it also shows us how general practitioners would come to the home and literally nurse at the bedside a patient who was dying. And this, this painting has become famous across the world and versions of it hang in medical schools all over Europe. Next, please. This, of course, is the context of Witz University and of our Johannesburg scene. We see the um, towers of Johannesburg's big buildings, but we are on the edge of Yeovil's Ridge. And behind us, if we were standing looking out at the scene, we've got the Yeovil Water Tower, the Victorian one, also built in 1891, the same year as that painting. And further behind it, we have the modern uh, concrete structure of the water tower. This place where the Yeovil Water Tower is overlooks Witz University. Just to the right of this picture is Witz Medical School with the iconic cross on the smokestack built in the late 1970s. And of course, it's also the site of the healing springs that bubbled up out of the ridge that we are on the very top of, looking down over where the mines were first established after 1886. And it's the highest point in the city where these bubbling springs came up, which gave the Scottish engineers who came to Johannesburg in the 1870s the idea that there could possibly be gold bearing rock that would be coming to the surface. And it's also the site where people living here three, 400 years ago, the ancestors of contemporary Sutra speaking people, where they brought themselves and their children to dip them in the healing springs. So this is the site actually of one of the oldest healing centers of the city, the mineral waters and springs that came up from the ridge of white waters and which ultimately go out in the Yuxke River and the smaller streams and waterheads around us. And it's so fascinating to me that it's where white settlers also created the first hospital, Hospital Hill in Hillbrow, the brow of the hill, it's where all of the medical institutions that we're affiliated to, the Witz Medical School, the teaching hospitals, now Charlotte McClecker, where they're all situated. But it's also the waterhead that looks down over where crown mines would be in the far distance and the uh, gold mine setting of our city. The reason, the raison d'etre for why we are here, this medical mining complex. And it's got, it's, uh, it's built upon pre-colonial and early colonial uh, mineral extraction because indigenous inhabitants, as you know, around the Melville Kopis, the still uh, existing caves have got the mines of people mining copper and surface level gold who were the original inhabitants of where we are. And it's also the site of where Scottish engineers came feverishly after the 1870s looking for gold and gold deposits all around here. And it's where they eventually found the world's still to this very day, deepest level, most precious seam of gold. Next, please. So our context is urban. It's based on the mineral revolution that happened in South Africa and drew colonists, settlers, workers from all over the world. And we created a very, very dense settlement here. It's one of the most densely settled urban conurbations on the African continent outside of Cairo, outside of Lagos and a few other larger cities like Nairobi. And Johannesburg has also got the highest HIV uh, prevalence in this region of Africa and the second highest in our country. Next, please. And WITS, as you all know better than I do, does a great deal of work across public health, engineering, built environment, clinical medicine, anthropology, sociology, law, governance, with the theme of healthy urban governance and public health advocacy as some of WITS's most outstanding characteristics, crossing over the boundary of 
clinical medicine, nursing, clinical laboratory science, and then its impact on people, on the communities and on the world. Next, please. Out of this context of our past, uh, violence, extraction, innovation, capitalist imagination, profiteering, but also the destruction of pre-colonial systems, the movement of people from all over the world, cosmopolitanism, um, injustice, uh, inequality. Out of this, the Cape Refreshment Station, which brought the first Dutch settlers here, and the long history of settler and indigenous contact, frontiers of cooperation and also violence, the mineral revolution, the Frieda Fort Dome, the geological formation that we sit in. We also see the growth, for example, of Kimberley and then Johannesburg and the sanitation syndrome that underpinned, as public health experts tell us, urban segregation, using health as a reason to separate people on race and class grounds. All of this context is what's shaped us. Next, please. And the political economy of our region, politics linked to extraction, linked to capitalism, linked to innovation, has made race and migrancy and a patchwork quilt of patriarchies, the division along gender lines in so many of our ancestral communities, fundamental to how we emerged as a, as a state in 1910. And universities got their start in South Africa in the late Victorian era and then in the early 20th century. And right from the very beginning, South Africa had to quote the Italian economist, a, a Gini coefficient that was extremely diverse, a small number of people with enormous amounts of wealth and the bulk of South Africans with very little wealth. And over the 20th century, white settlers and their descendants survived and Africans and other people of color survived. There wasn't a genocide here like there was in some other parts of the world, but this survival was not built on an equal paradigm. There wasn't a demographic collapse. In fact, many South Africans of Indian origin, of mixed background and of African origin thrived, but there were huge inequalities. And from the post Second World War era, when that painting of Gerard Sokoto uh, emerges all the way up to the present, what we see is growing uh, health inequalities and growing divides instead of a general upliftment of the entire community through the goods of capital accumulation being shared and through medicine, through development being shared equally. Next, please. South Africa, of course, as you all know, is also the origin place of humans and not very far away from where we sit, where I'm sitting, which is in a suburb uh, not far from Witz, we also had the center of humankind, the origins of humans around the Stirklantine cave area. There is also a contentious debate that possibly the older Vi Gorge in Tanzania is the origin point of human beings. But definitely on this, on this continent and definitely around where we are living, some of the oldest ancestors of all of us emerged. Next one, please. In the same region that we are developing our University of, of the Witwatersrand in, the Cox, uh, Sydney and Emily Cox, studied medicine. And along with the Jali family from KwaZulu-Natal and a number of other really important health educationists, such as uh, Dr. A.B. Krumer, who lived in present-day Savannah they begin to develop in the 1940s and 50s an idea of what social medicine could be, a combination of justice in medicine, excellence in medical research and in clinical knowledge, and also anthropological and historical knowledge about the country. And this, this is their legacy to South Africa, the origin of social medicine. They forced out of South Africa most of these professionals in the 1950s and 60s. Some of them are arrested. Some of them die in exile and they develop an idea of what medicine could be, a true medicine for the country, a healing that would bring science and technology, indigenous life and culture and respect for all at the very center of state formation. They bring this to the knowledge of the country, 
but they're pushed out most of them. And so a kind of higgledy-piggledy health system emerges that by the 70s and 80s has private health insurance and state health systems side by side. And medicine and nursing and other health professionals grow up in this a piecemeal form. Next, please. Many of us refer to this as a tri-continental frontier, where you have Asian, African, and European forms of knowledge and practice growing up, but not in a systematically thought through method. And for many people in the 80s and 90s, and all the way through to the present, South Africa comes to be seen as a laboratory, as a meeting of different parts of the world, with some of the world's greatest health burdens and health challenges with some of the greatest legacies of inequality in one place, but also with outstanding laboratory science and curative medicine at the center. It's a kind of Cartesian dualism, to use the name of René Descartes, the dividing of the world into a kind of rationalist, curative, capitalist, mind reasoning sense away from body, suffering, affect, emotion, culture. It's almost as if South Africa epitomizes this division. Next, please. And at the same time, as many of you know, South Africa becomes the center of a massive struggle against these inequalities, a constant effort to bring all aspects of human knowledge and human suffering together. And here we have solidarity, key elements of critical health, journals, study groups, health movements, progressive doctors and nurses, laboratory scientists committed to solving some of the most complex problems that bedevil South Africa. And medical schools and their allied disciplines become sites for huge struggle. And they also become sites of state attack. So the universities and particularly the medical schools become places where the uh, Pretoria government begins to target and intervene and name the effort for health solidarity as a kind of anti-state project. And pedagogical change begins to emerge and bubble up in the 70s and the 80s. Health rights for all. Next slide, please. And at the end of apartheid, solidarity and social justice are seen as part of medicine, part of the key elements of health the values of Bato Pele, health for all, parity in health system. And at the same time, the growth of private medicine is going to be yoked to or tied to a better health justice for all. There is an idea during Mandela's presidency that we can achieve both excellent pockets of private medicine alongside of the acceleration of outstanding public health goods for the whole country with respect and dignity and human rights at the center. Next slide, please. But at the very same time as Nelson Mandela uh, becomes president of a unified South Africa, getting rid of the old Bantustan system, drawing the best of South Africa together, using uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as a vehicle for declaring the need for justice and for truth, we uh, find ourselves in the middle of an HIV pandemic. And in the middle of that pandemic, before we had effective treatment, while we were still searching for a vaccine, which still eludes us, many health scientists in South Africa, many health professionals, health educators, virologists, people involved in internal medicine, pediatricians, nurses, they began to ask what was the reason that South Africa suffered the worst HIV pandemic in the world. And people turn to anthropology, sociology, history, psychology. They turn to indigenous philosophy, Ubuntu, the theory of how we are one through other people. And issues of care, calling or motivation, hospitality versus xenophobia get onto the central agenda. 20 years ago, we were asking in all of our health science faculties, what is it to be human? Next slide, please. And amazing texts were turned to as core resources for the set of questions. A book that had emerged from Nigeria called Imperial Bedlam, a brand new text by Julie Parr called States of Mind, and people went back to and read Harriet Ngobani's Body and Mind in Zulu Medicine. And we shared these texts across the faculties of humanities 
and health sciences in several very important parts of South Africa. And people who were trained in psychiatry, in virology, in internal medicine, made very, very close contact with people like myself in history and anthropology and psychology and health economics. And we began to say, this is going to be the way that South African health sciences develop in the future, not only to address HIV AIDS and its underlying causes, um, both at the level of anatomy, physiology, um, and curative medicine, but also the long-term social diseases that produce these kinds of epidemics. Next, please. And we began to reconsider what is it to be human in the wake of HIV AIDS. Next slide, please. I'm running out of time, so I have to speed up here, Janus. Next slide, please. And so it's not surprising that the medical and health humanities, a knowledge field that had long taken root in places like the United States, Canada, Australia, the two big Indian university medical schools, Hong Kong, Australia, and many, many parts of Eastern Europe, particularly Poland, but also Hungary, also Ireland, and of course the United Kingdom, it began to emerge in South Africa, this intersection of medicine and of health in relation to the social sciences and humanities. And the first university to host a number of conferences in South Africa on this was WITS, quickly spreading to UCT, and then later on to a couple of other universities, and then we created a platform for conferences with our colleagues in Malawi, Botswana, Egypt, Nigeria, and then much more recently, Kenya, Tanzania, and Ghana. And between 2015 and 2020, the 2020 ones were all online, we developed a number of paradigms of shared discussion across the uh, divides that were separating the humanities from the health sciences. Next slide, please. And we asked ourselves all the time, what have we learned about what it is to be human? What are the fundamental north and south relations? And what are the relations of power and knowledge across our faculties? Next, please. And we asked how in explicit as well as more informal ways have we created a space for the sharing of the sociology of health knowledge? Next slide, please. And so it was really exciting to see that in the course of the pandemic that hit our country and the rest of the world at the beginning of last year, that issues that had been at the core of the health and medical humanities came to the fore again. Patient care, aging and suffering, overlapping health modalities, including indigenous healing, the first thousand days of life, pandemics, vaccines and their legitimacy, mental anguish and social dis-ease, non-communicable diseases, I just extract one, the kidney, transplant, treatment of chronic kidney disease, nursing and nursing ethics in South Africa. Next slide, please. And so the why, the what, and the how of medical humanities really hit our university with force last year, even more than it had five years ago. And that's why I asked you all to skim through the reading of a health and medical humanities reader that I shared with you, and an opening article by Therese Jones, Delise Ware, and Lester Friedman, the delicate balance between biology and culture as it alters in a continuous flow is what constitutes the elusive truth of illness. That's how they begin their article at the beginning of this very um, influential reader. And I wonder if I could just um, share my screen for a moment, Janus. In the introduction that I've asked you to, to just skim through in this reader that people are using all over the world, it's it's more than 800 pages, this reader. Janus, can you just confirm with me that you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. You'll see that um, I have extracted the, the quote from David Morris from 1998. And these authors who are all medical doctors by training but also have PhDs in other fields, such as philosophy and history and literature, and who teach at leading um, health science um, faculties abroad. Some of them are at medical schools and some of them are in more broadly constituted fields of, of health professionalism. They put this question to us. 
why introduce and integrate the humanities into science and clinically based curricula such as medicine, nursing, pharmacy and allied programs? Why aren't the scientific basis of knowledge and the apprentice model of training adequate for healthcare practitioners to enter their chosen professions? And they referred to Clauser, the first philosopher to teach ethics at a medical school in the United States, who eloquently, they, they say, eloquently tried to answer such a question in a 1980 keynote address at a conference on the role of humanities in health education. What's missing in a vocational training? It leaves out everything that makes us uniquely human. Where do we train for understanding, suffering and joy? Where do we gain ideals and models for motivations, for patterning our lives, for fashioning our goals, emotions, attitudes and character? Where do we think about and entertain purposes, goals and styles of life? Where we, do we gain perspective on our own life, on others and the relationship between them? These things don't just happen, however much we like to believe they do. And they point out, the authors, that Clauser was espousing one of the most commonly advanced political and pedagogical justifications for what was then just a very, very nascent medical humanities movement, a belief that something vital and fundamental was missing in health professions education and that the humanities could, quote unquote, fill that gap. And they go on to chart the history of medical and health humanities being sort of a gap filling paradigm to a completely new understanding that emerged about 25 years later of the medical and health humanities being intertwined with and actually fundamental to the scientific paradigms itself. Um, can we go back to your slides for a minute, Janus? I'll stop sharing. If we can go to the next slide, please. And so I've asked you all to jump forward nearly 40 years from that first intervention to a, a paper published in 2018 by Michelle Pentecost and colleagues such as Bernard Gerber, who is based in, um, the, uh, in Switzerland, Megan Rainwright, who's based in Oxford, though she's a South African born and educated scholar, and Thomas Cousins, an anthropologist. Michelle is a doctor educated at UCT. She did her first degree at WITS in pharmacy, then she studied medicine at UCT, and then she eventually did a PhD in medical and health humanities and medical anthropology at Oxford University. And she and her young colleagues, all of them are under 35, decided to write an article about how they sensed the medical and health humanities time had really come. Next slide, please. In the article that I asked you to read closely, the authors make a case for humanization and the decolonization of health sciences curriculum in South Africa. And their overarching framework is an integrative one an education built on a consolidated conceptual framework that includes and equally values the natural or biomedical sciences as well as the humanities which would include the arts and social sciences respecting that all of this knowledge is absolutely critical to the practice of healthcare it's a curriculum that includes previously marginalized sources of knowledge challenging knowledge hierarchies which is part of decolonizing curricula addresses appropriate intellectual self-image in health sciences education, promotes understanding of history and social context, centering issues of inclusion, access and social justice by cultivating a social ethic as part of the curriculum, and finally focusing on care and relatedness as an essential aspect of clinical work, embedding this in fact in practice. Next slide, please. They argue in the conclusion of this article, which is about eight pages long that I asked you to read, that to achieve these goals is deeply complex, that it's context dependent. There's not a one size fits all curriculum and that the relational nature of health and the health sciences of disease and of healing necessitates that healthcare providers have insight, skills and knowledge from different disciplines 
and that these are not extraneous to or addable on, they are actually integral to the whole development of professional capacity in the health sciences. They point out that coming as they do from different universities, they know that reforming curricula will be extremely challenging. It will entail intervention at multiple levels, and it will also require careful retraining and reframing of the current generation of healthcare practitioners who currently mentor and teach health science students. And it will require courage, innovative blended learning, and new ways of assessing critical orientations, given what we know about assessment-driven learning. And they, their final sentence in their article, which has been downloaded many times and cited already in the last two and a half years all across the world, is that making these shifts is not an option anymore, that it is crucial and that we cannot shy away from them because we will be failing again to learn the lessons of the HIV pandemic. And they wrote this before COVID-19, of course, hit the world. So they're not antagonistic or in any way hostile to virology, to epidemiology, to medical modeling, to public health, to internal medicine, to anatomy, physiology, basic sciences. They embrace them and they actually, as an interdisciplinary team, they exemplify this. But they do also argue that if we keep thinking of health science education as a, um, a scientifically based model, which scientifically excludes the arts, it excludes uh, knowledge from, for example, performance, from indigenous healing, from metaphor, from history, then it is in fact not scientific enough because science is an all encompassing area of human knowledge that insists on the humanities and on um, social theory as part of science itself. And that is their overarching argument. I've spoken for about 32 minutes and I wanted to keep it to 30. So let's take questions from the audience to see what people made of this presentation, which I think is quite disruptive and might be even considered very radical, and what people made, particularly of the Pentecost et al. reading, and possibly also of the Teresa Jones uh, opening chapter from that reader. Over to you, Janice. Janice, will you chair the discussion now for us? Yeah, sure. I'll read out the questions if um, as they come in. Thank you. So while we wait for a um, question, Catherine, I've got one. How do we, in terms of practically embed, um, embedding medical humanities in a curriculum and so forth, how, yeah, how do you go about doing that? I see Richard's also got his hand up, but let's maybe start from something that's closest to home to all of us. It's so striking to me, and I'm not sure if it will be to other colleagues as well, how little most people in the health field in South Africa know about South Africa's health history, how we come, came to have the institutions that we do, why we made the choices that we did. For example, before the 1960s, in all of our big medical schools, which were very, very hierarchical, it was very difficult for white women to get into medicine, let alone people of color of outstanding talent from across all the rich resources of our South African demography. So medicine was very exclusionary and, and nursing was very exclusionary, though opening up faster than medicine was. Um, in that paradigm, all students at South African medical schools, just to choose that for a minute, all had to study the languages, some aspect of anthropology and sociology and they all had to know something about health and how it had emerged in human history. The kind of curriculum they were taught was very Eurocentric and it, um, it put forward a very teleological argument that medicine emerged from the sort of ancient Greek philosophical thinkers. 
it mobilized again in the Renaissance period. And European thinkers drove medical science and medical expertise through laboratory medicine, through experimental medicine, and through the development of um, exploratory chemical and anatomical knowledge that burst into view during the Enlightenment in Europe. So this was the narrative that was given. And South Africa uh, sort of grabbed onto the coattails of this argument and through the development of settler-based institutions of health and learning, South African medical schools emerged and became themselves expert practitioners and, and inheritors of this Western system. Now, this, this paradigm is flawed in so many ways. So the story itself is no longer plausible. And all over the world, including at the world's top Western universities, this is no longer the story of the history of medicine and of the health sciences and of clinical science that's taught. This is considered completely and utterly debunked going back at least 40 years. So when I did my master's degree at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore um, in the 80s, I was taught a very different history of medicine, of clinical medicine, of clinical science, and of how medical institutions and nursing institutions emerged. And then I myself went and wrote dissertations for my master's and PhD on the history of health institutions in South Africa and how they had emerged based on the, the very different understanding of how they'd emerged in Western Europe. When I came back to South Africa to teach at my first experience inside of a health science faculty, which was in Durban, I found that many of the uh, medical professors there and many of the students, if they were taught the history of medicine at all, they were taught something that had been debunked even in places like Oxford and Cambridge and Padua and Cairo and New Delhi and Baltimore. So the first thing that I think is very interesting is for people to understand how complex medical institutions are, how medical schools and nursing schools and allied health professionals emerged, and how an idea of a curriculum first came into being. Because people assume it's either always been there or that its foundations were not contested, and both are false. And I think if that is sort of a first basis upon which to emerge, then many fundamentals that are naturalized in uh, clinical and health science spaces get opened up for debate, and then very, very exciting questions bubble to the fore. So that's um, just an opening gambit. But let's hear from the questions that are bubbling up from the audience. So I'll hand over to Prof Cook. Um, I see his hands up. And after that, um, there's a question from Awiwe, which I'll read out. Janus, thank you. And, and Catherine, thanks very much. And, and Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, perhaps you, Catherine, just remaining on the on the the, the influencing and changing curricula um, in health sciences students um, a little bit more. Um, I mean, Pentecost at Ireland in the article that you shared. I mean, they they, they were they, there was very much the the and if I'm if I'm quoting it correctly the. The, the, the pedagogy and practice must, must undergo an important shift. And that if we don't do that, then we're failing both patients and practitioners alike. Now, now are we to, if, if we're looking at our strategy of, of change in curriculum, do, do we, on the, on the one side, do we focus on, on a, the importance of, of inclusion of and more consideration of Medical humanities for medical humanities, for that as a subject, as a as a as a theme, as a as a as a course, etc. Do we focus on that importance, or is there a danger of 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 us not necessarily um, taking the or converting the naysayers or converting the 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 those not interested or those just looking at this from a very biomedical discipline based frame of reference. How much do we balance between doing that on the one side um, and, uh, and, and then on the other side, just aligning it, aligning medical humanities with other recognized uh, changes that 
perhaps are, are what, a little bit more mainstream, a little bit more accepted? Because we've got to drag people along with us as well as pushing them. Um, because, so, so take decolonization, for example. If, if, we, if, we could, if we can align medical humanities for, for being a tool by which to decolonize our curricula, is, is that a, is that, that's it, from what you're telling me and from the readings, that's certainly a route that we should be going. But do you appreciate the, the slight, um, the, 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 the challenge I'm having with, with pursuing medical humanities for what it is on the one side and, and its importance and on the, for inclusion, but on the other side, trying to align it with other, other accepted changes that we need to be making. I, I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit for me in terms of your thinking. Thank you so much, Richard. And I think some of what I would have as a response might also link to Constance Cooper and Aviwa Ngobozi's questions, which I see in the um, chat section. But obviously, they may want to air their questions more fully in a minute. The reason why I haven't taken in the last year, while I've been in the health science faculty, while I've been based here, why I haven't taken the decolonization um, framework and seized it and, and sort of thought this is the way that we can really work with it is because the university as a whole and all universities in South Africa and, and the world are grappling with what it means to decolonize knowledge. And we've done some really interesting readings about that in various journal forums and in discussions on WITS campus, both in the health science faculty and other spaces. And that is, a, it's a highly contested space which um, can be very terrifying for many people and also very exciting for many people. But it's volatile, it's charged with energy, it's, it's propulsive. So that's why I used the Pentecost article as a way to get that discussion gently going in this group. But I haven't used that paradigm at the foreground. Instead, what I've done is I've done a lot of self-reflection on what went right and what went wrong with what a group of us tried to do in 2012 to 20, well, about 2013 to 2019 or so, uh, over and you can say over the over Jan Smuts Avenue, over that space in the um, in the other campus of its, with the science faculty, with the law and commerce people, and with humanities, we tried to start at the graduate level with honors, um, masters, and particularly doctoral students with seminars, with research-based um, uh, products, with um, the sharing of um, resources that we gl gleaned from abroad, from the Mellon Foundation, from the Wellcome Trust, and a little bit from South Africa's National Science Foundation, but starting at the level of research. So we tried to create communities of practice and had lots of conferences and colloquia and we published in journals and we argued that there was so much that could be gained through disruption and through crossing silos that were separating us around agentive research issues that would be very, very high level. And we had no interest in or no resources poured towards and no curriculum redesigning at the undergraduate level. And we got support from the then VC for that and deans. But when we look back on it, we saw that WITS had not moved very much as a result. So people's careers had developed and people had published and some new research ideas had remained. But our colleagues abroad, for example, at Duke University in the United States, at Oxford University in the UK, at the Chancellor's College in Malawi, which is a, a medical and health science faculty there, and at UCT, which had actually copied us in a way, they'd moved much faster. And that's because they had started with curriculum development from the bottom up. They worked in a curriculum redesign. They worked in teams with first year students going up. Yes, they did continue to talk with us at this level, but what they mainly did was they, they worked out ways to create um, communities of practice at the undergraduate level up. 
and they've had a much more lasting impact with fewer resources than maybe WITS did. And they've actually been able to draw people together through trust, through doing rather than talking, and through making rather than publishing as they go. And in a sense, they've had a more radical outcome, Richard, by starting in a different place. So I think that in one way to answer your question is that we don't have to have either or. We can begin to work with colleagues and show efficacy through building resources from the humanities into very biomedically driven um, areas of content. And by not focusing on filling up the bucket with more content, but twinning together in paradigm shift and in discipline shifting and sharing. And at the same time, through this methodology, begin to um, elucidate core concepts of the medical and health humanities, which often have a very strong attraction in biomedical spaces as well, around problem solving, conundra, systems thinking, critical thinking, these, these are very, very, uh, and, and what counts as evidence in medicine and health, these are core concepts which the MBBCH, the clinical BSCs are all driving towards, nursing is driving towards as well. Nursing is a real leader here in problem-based learning. And when we, in, when we insert in that way and we make things with other people, then the, when we step back and we're reflective on it, the learning can be very radical without upfronting. This is going to be a decolonized paradigm. This is going to put indigenous healing to the fore and not just as an add on. And I think that is a way of being quite radical and quite disruptive, but also extremely respectful and, and, and in a sense, showing through doing rather than pontificating or coming from the top down. I don't know if that fully addresses your question, but it's an effort to begin to approach your complex and challenging question. Maybe the others would like to come in here. Yanis, our chair. Um, I've got nothing else to add, Catherine. Um, did, did we want to ask um, a viewer can I read a viewer's question out? It kind of, it is not exactly the same as Richard's question, but it's it's on the side of it. So, okay, it's, are there any international universities that have successfully integrated medical humanities in their curricula? Yes, there are. Um, and I, I realize that there are other questions as well, Stephen, because I haven't been able to follow all the questions. I mean, Janus, I haven't been able to follow all the questions. It's fascinating, um, Avi, where there are several universities that have integrated it fully. Um, one is a very, very, very rich private university, very exclusionary, very difficult to get into, very large resources, not probably a model that we could ever follow. And that Stanford University, both its medical school and its broader health sciences um, faculty, I can tell you a very interesting story about that. The person that helped Stanford University do that was born in Ethiopia, and his parents were both originally from India. They came to Ethiopia in the middle of the century to help build the post-Second World War Ethiopian education and health system. They were both doctors. The man's surname is Verhesi. He came from the Goan community of India in that uh, set of islands around South India, and his parents uh, came from a part of India that had been colonized by the Portuguese, rather like Mozambique. So many people in that part of India were converted to Catholicism or could speak some element of Portuguese. And many of them took surnames or names that come from a Christian tradition. So his name is Abraham Bohisi. And his parents actually were not very religious Christians by the time they came to Ethiopia because they had become socialists and they were very activist socialist doctors in India. And they came with a group of other doctors to Ethiopia and they, they worked flat out for 30, 40 years to build a post-colonial Ethiopian society under Haile Selassie. And they had many successes and many failures. And as Ethiopia in the 1980s teetered towards a, a dictatorship, um, his parents urged him and his brother 
to go and study in the UK and eventually he ended up in the United States. And his first sort of shock experience of practicing as a young doctor was in the HIV pandemic on the Mexico-US border when he was in Texas. And the, he, he realized that the epidemic in that part of the United States was born on the body of brown people, very, very poor people, migrant workers, and it was a heterosexual epidemic, not, not carried inside of the gay community and not through IV drug users. And he began to really struggle with the medical knowledge that he'd been trained with in the UK, trying to make sense of HIV, trying to make sense of the experience of the Southern United States, race, empire, migration, and he began to read voraciously and he began to study philosophy and history part time. And he developed a medical and health humanities curriculum at a very much poorer university in that part of the world. And much later, when he became a very famous published novelist, poet and author, um, and in fact, his, he, he, one of his books, Cutting for Stone, which is a highly autobiographical book of, of, of Ethiopia, when that had won a number of prizes, he noted that universities that were much richer in the United States and were also struggling with similar issues would always invite him to help them change their curricula. And eventually he was in fact appointed to Stanford University, where he made a condition of his appointment there that um, health humanities would be integrated throughout the entire curricula of that very elite university. And to this day, students study uh, the arts, poetry, and so on and so forth. So that's at the end of extreme privilege and a very elite university. But remember that he came from a different place and was working with far fewer resources financially, but with a lot of heart and with a lot of colleagues supporting him in Texas. That's one example. Another example is Chancellor University in Malawi, which has rethought its entire health sciences and medical curricula with the help of University College London, which is another university in the UK that has a very strongly developed um, health humanities curriculum right embedded into its medical school. And also with the help of the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, which is a highly regarded, mainly postgraduate entity also in the UK. Those two universities had a very long relationship with Malawi, a very dependent hierarchical colonial relationship where they extracted um, knowledge from Malawi, where they practiced uh, tropical medicine in Malawi and where there was a very unequal relationship. And about 15 years ago, people in Malawi and people in the UK were very unsatisfied with that. And they went back to the drawing board and began to re uh, rework through the way that the uh, resources of Malawi had gone northwards to London. It was very little going south again. And many of Malawi's top politicians, and in fact, one of their heads of state, had been educated at UCL or at the London School of Tropical Medicine. And Malawi had become a kind of dependent ent entity on the uh, with tobacco relations and with other forms of capitalist extraction on the UK. So they had a whole rethinking of this and they wished for the goods to move in a much more horizontal way. So both in Malawi and in those two important institutions in the UK, they began to rethink, how do we teach bioclinical sciences? How do we think about chemistry, anatomy, physiology, family medicine, uh, pediatrics, um, basic sciences? And how do we also think about history, respect, um, what it is to be a human, what empowers medical practitioners, how can patients also lead care, what are the other paradigms that make medicine both an art and a science, and how can we do this in London and in Blantyre and Zomba, the, the two capitals of Malawi, how do we do this in with more respect and with a better health outcome for all, so we improve clinical medicine, we improve medical education, we improve legitimacy of uh, medicine in society at the same time as we respect each other as partners. So those are just two examples I can give you a view where, and I can give you many, many others because I've now spent years reading and visiting and traveling to many countries, as I said, in India. I haven't been to um, the mainland universities in China where they also have been doing this for a while, but I've been to Hong Kong, I've been to Taiwan, I know people are doing this in Singapore, several universities in Australia, several other parts of um, East Africa, the university medical school in Lagos, in Ghana, 
and many, many universities in Europe, Northern Europe, in Ireland, in Canada and the United States. So that's kind of a big rushed answer to you, but hopefully with two examples, the Stanford example and the uh, example of UCL, which is a state university in the UK, the London School and um, Chancellor University in Malawi. Um, mm. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Um, I think um, we we basically out of time, but I think Constance's question is also um, quite important um, in terms of um, the um, Constance mentions that the medical cur curriculum is already so over overloaded with con it's a very content heavy curriculum and so forth. So, what do you suggest could be done to balance current curricula? load and the humanities essentials um, that are clearly required. I know you sort of alluded to it in your answer to Richard, but if you for just a minute could quickly um, yeah, speak to that. Oh, am I back? I got oh, beat yes. out for a second. I'm sorry. I was just saying back to um, to my colleague that one of the comments that a very a seasoned educator made, whose background is originally in nursing, is that we keep on adding more and more and more content to the curriculum, um, and it's it's almost unfeasible now. So perhaps we're reaching a point where colleagues in leading disciplines in the health sciences are also themselves totally leave out the humanities completely for a minute. I think there's a tipping point that people are realizing that it, we cannot keep pouring content in. Everybody's saying we have to teach this, we have to teach this, we have to teach this, we have to teach this. We could look at the report of our health ombud, Professor Malakapura Mohova, just a couple of months ago, which he brought out when he reviewed all the material from the Tembisa hospital death of a young South African last year during COVID. Or his Life is a Demeni report, which he brought out two years before. We could just look at those two reports in which he says we are failing on all accounts to produce really good health systems and really good health practitioners. Of course, there are exceptions. Thousands and thousands of clinical scientists and health professionals are outstanding in South Africa. But we are overall not achieving our goals in health sciences education or even in health sciences research. We simply not the goals we have set, the goals that biomedically driven professionals have set. So we cannot solve that by just pouring in more content. We've got to start thinking in a smarter and better way about how we think about the way we will achieve content. People have to be lifelong learners. There are certain domains of knowledge which are so much more advanced now than they were in 1950 that we cannot expect a person to have the same approach to some of the basic sciences as they did then. We, we have to spend a lot more on how people learn and how they can keep learning, sometimes through their own forms of self-actualization how a fundamental concepts and fundamental knowledge can be taught, and at the same time, how to position people in reflective, dialogical, thinking ways, where it's not only content that needs to be added to, but the form that we learn in and the learning communities that we create. And this is where the outstanding health scientists, biomedical health scientists, clinicians of the future are coming from. This, this space, which is terrifying for many people to agree to make together, but which if we don't do, the buckets and buckets and buckets we're creating of more and more content will not produce the outcome that we're seeking. So balancing the current curricular load is not about throwing out things and then pushing in more humanities things. It's about stepping back and saying, OK, so this is a piece of content that needs to be definitely taught. This is the methodology and the format that needs to go with it so that if pieces of it 
are shown to the learner and the learner goes on that journey and the learner is able to to practice with their own knowledge that that piece of received content that learner is also learning a way of learning so that the content will keep being embedded as the learner moves forward into a professional life as a clinician but their structure and their form of learning the epistemology as well as the ontology will be married we will not just be doing more and more content without a shift in forms of knowledge and learning and so it's that philosophical step that needs to happen and and that that is possible it is doable and there's so many of us in the health science faculty doing it already but it is the way that we have to try and bridge the gasping overwhelmedness of our colleagues around the question of more content, more content, more content. Thanks, Catherine. Um, thank you for a very, very um, insightful session. I see there's even more questions um, coming in, but um, that would, yeah, we would have to leave for another day. I think I just wanted to add one thing to Constance's um, uh, question about um, the um, curriculum content and the overload. I mean, it's very well known that that uh, medical curricula are very o o content heavy, um, and and what you mentioned about that we're just adding and adding. I think um, the other thing you mentioned about other universities that were more successful was that they completely re-looked at the curriculum and and looked at the learning outcomes and the alignment between that. And I think that should be a starting point is not to see where you um, can add more content, but whether what is already being taught to speak, you know, is is really necessary to be in in the curriculum and so forth. But yeah, starting starting from scratch and designing um, around that. But yeah, thank you once again for the session and I hope everyone's got a um, good evening. Thank you for giving me the chance to give that a shot, everybody. And I've been taking note of all of your comments and I really appreciate that very much. Thank you. It was a real privilege. Thank you, Kathy.